you to when we are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Do you know why some businesses succeed and some businesses fail? Why some businesses grow and some businesses don't? That's what this show is all about. Business, business, business. All right. here. Just the two <laughs> Muscatels, or Abbott and Costello, if you will. Oh, so, yeah. Or, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, I'm not even going to ask which one's you which. Okay. So, <laughs> so. Now, the cool thing is, this is good. The, the, the cool thing is, we have one of your favorite writers on today, which is Corey Doctorow. Yes, the Canadian, the Canadian blogger and journalist, Corey Doctorow, yep. author of and, The Bezel. Author of the and, and we must say he was published in the Financial Times. Of course, thanks to us, it was all our hard work. No, they read his blog and they loved him. Um, and we're going to talk about his blog and how you can get it for free, um, which is also very nice. But yeah, so we're going to talk about what to Corey a whole bunch of things today. I understand. Bring so yeah, bring Corey. Bring, let's bring Corey in. You want to run a com do you want to run a commercial first to pay oh, the yeah, bills? You just want to have right. Corey the commercial and then Corey? Okay. I know you're excited. Calm down. It's like your wedding night. Calm down. It's going to go quick. So. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. And right. now we can get excited. We now can bring Corey. Excited. Now we can bring him in. So, and there he is. Hey Live there. from Canada. How are you doing? Uh, well, Burbank. It's uh, it's the southernmost part of Canada. I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Burbank, Callan. Cal you know, there's a place in California called the same thing. It's uh, amazing that you, it's not that close. So. <laughs> Indeed. I can I can see it from my front porch like Sarah Palin. There you go. In Russia. If I knew that when I was in Beverly Hills about a month ago for business, I was there for three or four days, I would have reached out. We could have had dinner. Well, you know, I've been on Next the road time. with this book. Uh, so chances are I wasn't here. <laughs> wow. This is like I'm getting dumped. So thank you. Right, right here. Yeah, right. Right, right, right on there. Right here. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had we had Corey on last time uh, for uh, the Internet Con, which was how to seize the means of computation. A great book about the uh, the the, the inchi partly in the inchitification of right. the tech industry and how they control everything uh, right now. And uh, now Corey's got a new book, The Bezel, which is out. Uh, which is uh, tell us a little bit about the Bezel, Corey. And uh, you know, I've been reading through it. I've got some questions for you, but give us the scoop. On, uh, on what it's about and what motivated you to bring it to life. Yeah, so The Bezel is uh, part of a series I'm writing about this uh, forensic detective called, or forensic accountant rather, called Martin Hench. Uh, mm -hmm. And his deal is that he spent 40 years in Silicon Valley busting high-tech finance scams. And the books are written to be read in any order. The first one is, is actually his final adventure. Uh, that was Red Team Blues that came out last year. Uh, okay. And it's a cryptocurrency heist novel. This one is the second book. Again, you can read them in any order. And and it's about uh, Martin Hench, this this forensic accountant who's like the zealot of high tech finance crime. He's been uh, present for every single one of the the great scams of technology. And in this one, we we open in the um, a period that itself is a bezel. So bezels is a very useful term. I, I don't mean B-E-Z-E-L, like the, the black rectangle on your phone screen. B-E-Z-Z-L-E is this term uh, that John Kenneth Galbraith came up with to describe the interval after the con artist has your money, but before you know it's a scam. And in that moment, you both right. feel happier. If you've ever seen, uh, I was just thinking about this this morning. If you've ever seen the stage uh, pickpocket, Apollo Robbins work, he does this thing where he takes your watch. And the way that he right. does it is he puts his fingers around your wrist while he loosens your watch. And as your watch comes loose, his fingers take the place of it. And then he just eases his fingers away. And until you look down and notice your watch is gone, there is this moment where you think you have a watch and he thinks he has a watch and the total supply of satisfaction on earth 
uh, related to people who have watches is is larger, right? Uh, and the bezel is that period, like after you've given Sam Bankman Fried your money, but before you ask him for it back, you know, uh, and, and right. SPF, he's still living the bezel, right? He, he's like, oh, you know, if you just let me continue to gamble, I would have gotten all that money back. The money wasn't really right. gone. It was just like temporarily mislaid. And, and we lived through a long bezel period after the dot-com crash leading up to the, uh, the next big crash, the great financial crisis yep. where everybody felt better off, but we weren't. And that was a period during which, among other things, uh, the Saudi royal families gave Masayoshi son billions of dollars for his soft bank investment fund, which then gave it to Yahoo, which then used it to buy every promising tech startup and destroy them. And mm -hmm. uh, that's really the, the inciting incident here. Marty's got a pal who's sold a startup to Yahoo, and it's so miserable that he just doesn't want to go into the office. And being a hacker, he just like reads his employment contract. And he's like, actually, Technically, I'm entitled to so much vacation time as a VP here. I could take a four day week every week and like a three day week some weeks. And so he just sort of stops coming to the office and he discovers the the good life on Catalina Island, this this uh, pleasure island just off the coast of Long Beach that was originally owned by the Wrigley family of Wrigley Chew and Bug Gum fame. It's where the CIA was founded. Marilyn Monroe was a child bride there. It's like quite an amazing place. They have uh, island dwarves. There's a, there's a fox the size of a squirrel and they have an island giant, which is a squirrel the size of a fox. And, and among other things, they have a rule that says there's no fast food restaurants allowed. This was a thing old man Wrigley set up because billionaires are weird and getting very rich takes 30 points off your IQ. And, uh, and, and so he, he decided no one would, would be able to get fast food. And so today there's a little kind of black market in, in fast food. If you're like in the K to 12 school and you go away for an away game, you're expected to bring back like a sack of sliders for, for the people back home they discover a Ponzi scheme based on this, where people are mm -hmm. smuggling in and deep freezing these burgers. And of course, as with any Ponzi scheme, the thing that people are buying really isn't burgers. It's like the right to sell burgers or the right to sell the right to sell burgers, the right to sell the right to sell the right to sell burgers. And uh, they discover that there's like a real estate guy who's kind of cooked this up and he's done it just for the sadism of it. And they do a controlled uh, demolition of this Ponzi scheme. They figure out how it's running. They figure out its weak points. They trigger a liquidity crisis and the whole thing falls apart, which is good for the audience because it's the bezel, right? The bezel has been, has been ruptured before it can suck in all the wealth of the island. Uh, but of course, this pisses off the real estate guy, which leads us into the main adventure because the real estate guy in retaliation pulls a, a con on Marty's friend that, that ends up with him having two felonies on his record. And then he gets one more. And this is the time of California three strikes rule where three felonies, you go to prison mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. And the real story here is a prison tech story. It's a story yeah. about how tech predators are taking the lives of the prisoners in the country that imprisons the most people of any country in the history of the world and just making them unimaginably worse as well as the lives of their families with mm -hmm. these uh, so-called free tablets that you get in prison. And that's <clears throat> that's what I was really intrigued by and, and in, in your fiction works in general is that there's so much truth in it. So tell us about one one of the things that Marty talks about is how much how much as a, a forensic accountant, how much of the economy he thought was actually a scam. And in the beginning, he thought, well, maybe it was only 80-20, uh, where 20% was, was a scam. And then uh, the financial crisis happens and he thinks, well, maybe it's really 40-60 and then so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. getting worse and worse. Uh, how much truth is in this book uh, from your perspective of uh, of this? And how much are, how much of this book is really getting across to the reader how much of this truth is actually a re reality? Well, I think there's a, a remarkable amount of scamming in the way our economy works. You know, I, I sometimes call these books Panama Papers fanfic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and if you go and, and read the Panama Papers, which everyone should, they're really it's it's the investigative series is incredible as well as the irs papers and lux leaks and all these other big finance leaks one of the things you discover yeah. is that the the scams that they dic that they describe they're not um they're not hard to understand because they're complicated they've been made complicated in order that they should be hard to understand. That's right. That it's a kind of performative complexity. It's a simple trick, even a crude one, done uh, a lot of times in a row 
uh, and and sometimes very quickly. So you know, with any shell game, it's the quickness of the hand that deceives the eye. And um, and and you know, in a noir story, you typically have a cop, or, or rather a detective, who is who is acting as an unlicensed cop. They're going to the places the cops can't go, asking the questions the cops can't ask, and that lets them solve the crimes the cops can't solve. And by the end of the story, and this is what makes it noir, they have uh, a forceful reminder that these were, in fact, places the cops didn't want to go, questions the cops didn't want to mm -hmm. ask, and crimes the cops didn't want to solve. And anyone who reads the IRS files or the Lux Leaks or Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, realizes that these are these are scams that are features and not bugs. That, that uh, right. the reason we haven't gotten rid of these trillions of dollars in scams is because we've decided not to, not because it would be very hard to do so. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the, the thing about a scam is that if it's not related to a fundamental, if you can uncouple it from a fundamental, then you can multiply it at, at great volume, right? So, you know, if the only like collateralized debt obligations you can mint have to have some real estate behind them, that are uh, that you know you're making a bet on that you're doing a, a you know a, a swap with, um, then the number of CDOs is limited by the number of you know mortgages, right? But add in the synthetic CDO, mm -hmm. right, where you can take like a bet on a hypothetical, right? Now right. you can make as many of these things as you want, and so what you end up with is a great multiplication, where the real economy becomes dwarfed by the um, scam economy and you know the ethos of the business world for the last 40 years has increasingly mm -hmm. been something that um that uh, uh douglas rushkoff he calls it going meta so why drive a cab when you can start uber and play matchmaker between cabs and riders why start uber when you can invest in uber and benefit from someone else playing matchmaker why invest in uber when you could buy futures in uber why buy futures in uber when you could buy complex derivatives of futures in uber right mm -hmm. the further away you can get from the productive economy the more insulated you can get from things that happen to real people the more the game becomes heads you win uh heads i win tails you lose and uh uh that is the game everyone's to play and so the scam economy gets bigger and bigger especially relative to the real economy so that's right. that's an that's an infuriating uh, reality. <clears throat> is that uh, at least at least when I was reading uh, the bezel, you know, part of it was just how can you not feel enraged the fact that this is true and this is actually there because the the penalties are actually being paid by real people who are generally powerless or vulnerable or just not in the know either by choice or uh, by design, and uh, you know is is. What's the what's the goal of these of this kind of book? Is part of it to awaken people to this? Is part of it just to to make people aware, or uh, <laughs> or is it just to be infuriating? Well, at the risk of being too uh, like artsy fartsy here, right? I'm a novelist. I write novels because they're artworks, right? Mm. And the point of a work of art is to take an irreducible, numinous, complicated feeling that is in the head of the creative worker move it to a intermediate medium, like a story or a song or a sculpture or a painting, and then hope that some echo of that feeling occurs in the mind of the person who experiences the artwork. Mm. And so first and foremost, this is about reproducing an, exp uh, an emotional uh, sense that I have. Now, one of my overweening emotional senses is holy shit, this stuff is, is infuriating. <laughs> so, you know, if you're feeling that fury, it, it's part of the, the complicated emotion that I experience. Right. So, you know, mission accomplished, but there's also, you know, with the, with the bezel, with any bezel, with any scam, it depends on this performative complexity that triggers this rule of thumb that we have, where we assume that complicated things that we don't understand are probably okay because the experts understand them mm. in the finance sector they call this migo which stands for my eyes glaze over uh, mm -hmm. and the ostrich and, we call it the ostrich syndrome people put their head in the sand because yeah. they don't want to know uh mm -hmm. you know you make the prospectus thick enough and people go oh yeah. well a pile of shit this big must have a pony under it somewhere 
right? right. And so, uh, you know, whether you have John Oliver or or Adam Conover on every on Adam Runes Everything, or you know Margot Robbie, Robbie in a bathtub explaining CDOs, vaccinating people against the bezel, right? Like letting them understand mm. the the simple trick done quickly that makes it seem like magic. Mm. You know, Penn and Teller doing the cup and balls with transparent cups and balls, right? right. Is is a way to help people uh, to armor people against future instances in in which they themselves come into harm's way and mm -hmm. also to help them understand the extent to which this stuff is not inevitable but rather a policy choice right like i think a lot of the time when we think about the world that we're in particularly when we talk about how the internet got so bad so quickly it's tempting to fall back on an almost mystical explanation where you invoke something like the great forces of history you know, the great forces of history bore down on this moment and made every tech CEO decide to turn their platform into a giant pile of shit. That, that's not the case, right? What's actually happened is that, is that uh, specific decisions were taken by named individuals. We can reverse those decisions. We can discover the names of those individuals. We can probably infer what size pitchfork they wear, right? So we don't have to take it lying down. And that's the other thing that... Mm -hmm. Uh, unraveling these scams does is it takes it out of the third person passive voice mistakes were made and actually lets you point at yeah. Sam Bankman Freed or but we don't but we say. won't do but we won't do that because our government won't do that the public doesn't want to do it because they like to play ostrich and the business people especially the Wall Street guys won't want to do that because they won't make money. Well, look, so we, we did it. We did it with uh, with the trust busters in the Gilded Age. And it's not like the people who who figured out how to muster the political will and then mobilize it. We're doing something that's like a forgotten art. Right. It's not like right. embalming pharaohs or something. Right. Like right. the actual tactics they used were were again tactics that are available to us. They weren't smarter than us. They weren't wizards. Right. They were but just they like cared. But they care today. People don't well, care. That's part of the issue, I think. It's that's why people don't do it. And also, we we'll disagree with us. Yeah. Well, the only reason like FTX got in trouble is because they pissed off a sovereign wealth fund and a bunch of billionaires. Yeah, they made rich people unhappy. Yeah. Right. When, when you make rich people unhappy, things happen. What I when you look at something like the SVB bank, we should have yep. never bailed them out, but we of had course. to bail them out because yep. all the billionaires had their money there, and we can't yep. have billionaires be poor. So yep. if it doesn't affect the top 1% or the top 5% of the population, no mm. one's going to do anything. I, see, I, think, I think you're wrong. I think we have okay. seen massive, uh, uh, gigantic movements, right? Starting with Occupy and going on. Now, they've been put down one after another. Yeah. Uh, but, but if you look at the history of the revolt against the Gilded Age, it, it was the same thing, right? It wasn't right. like the first time they tried, it worked. Right. They, right. they did it over and over again uh, and, and with movements that got progressively larger until they were unstoppable. And I think the coalition for doing something about inequality uh, and and about the scam economy, it's larger than it's ever been. Indeed, I think, you know, our biggest risk is not that people don't give a damn. It's that they right. get tricked into thinking that the way to do something about how furious they are is, is that they vote for Donald Trump. Right. Well, I was just going to say, if the orange man system. gets in, what happens then? Because if the orange man gets in, I keep saying this, I, I don't think I'm wrong, but I could be. We're going to a 1930s style Germany and he wants to be a dictator slash autocrat who's going to be Putin. So that's a whole well, different economy. Look, well, the relationship it, between between economic unfairness and um, and totalitarianism is really well understood. And you know, one of my favorite stories about how contingent history is, right? Like how hard it is to predict the course of history is that in the at the Treaty of Versailles, you had three major negotiators, right? You had France, England, and the United States in the person of Woodrow Wilson. And and France and England wanted blood. They they wanted Germany to make war reparations that would make them whole no matter what that would do to the German economy. And Wilson said, look, if you bankrupt Germany, um, they will uh, they will become a, a military belligerent again. The, the only way to keep Germany from, from falling prey to, to the same kind of belligerence that they engaged in that led to the First World War is to give them a chance to recover. And he was winning, but then he got the Spanish flu. Right, and so he basically uh, uh, tapped out for the remainder of the negotiation, 
All of the advances that he'd made were rolled back. Germany was made to pay reparations that exceeded what it could actually bear. Germany's economy became so uh, weak and, and so awful that when Hitler came along and said, all right, um, we are going to, uh, we're going to do something about this, people voted for him, right? Well, he didn't yeah. actually get elected. He formed a, a minority party, but, but he, he uh, you know, his rise to power can be directly traced to the uh, uh, decision to, um, uh, you know, allow corruption to run rampant, to, to do something materially unfair. <clears throat> Uh, and so I think, you know, those are the stakes. I think you're right to say that the stakes of an economy that everybody knows is rigged uh, are, are is something really dreadful. Um, right. I think that it's it's but, you know, just as contingency created the um, the the circumstances in which Germany fell into fascism, contingency also created the circumstances in which FDR got elected and FDR, who was an aristocrat who didn't give a shit about economic policies, whose New Deal was never described during his election, uh, mm -hmm. ended up falling prey. You know, it was just an empty election promise, but he fell. Uh, he, he was unable to stop the elements within his own party who basically made him do a new deal that was almost as muscular as it could be. There were a few things left out, like a jobs guarantee, um, where, you know, he didn't want to do them. He, he actually very famously said to a group of activists, I want to do it, now make me do it, which is really another way of saying, I don't want to do it, but if you make me do it, I will. And, and it was because there was political will. And, you know, today we're in this moment where you have like Lena Khan who's the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, who became federal ch trade chair through, again, the most contingent set of circumstances. You had these low low information Republicans who thought that the, you know, the woman who wrote a paper about how big tech sucked would, would piss off the tech platforms they thought were shadow banning conservatives. And so they voted for her just to, you know, sort of spit in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Mark Zuckerberg's eye. Uh, and now she's done more in three years on antitrust than, right. you know, her predecessors have done in, in 40. Uh, we have every single big tech platform is is now facing some kind of significant antitrust enforcement. Um, okay. They they uh, you know she's she's had just strings of victories, and you can tell that she's really making a difference because the Wall Street Journal has run a hundred editorials saying that she's not making any difference at all. And I got to tell you, like, there's no way Rupert Murdoch pays his editorial board to write a hundred editorials about someone who's not getting anything done. Yeah. And is that part of so? And, and is that part of where your optimism around the people's uprising against inequality is coming from? I mean, where else do you see glimmers of hope uh, of people who are kind of waking up to the scam economy and saying uh, there's got to be less inequality for all? Well, let me be clear here. I I don't believe in optimism. I think optimism is fatalism. It's just the belief that things will get better on their own. So I think far more right. interesting than optimism is is always going to be hope. And hope is the idea yeah. that if you take a, an affirmative step, that in so doing, you might reveal some terrain that you couldn't see from where you were sitting before that lets you take another affirmative step. And so I look at things like the antitrust movement scoring these really big victories that would have been unthinkable in, you know, not that long ago. And I, and I say, um, wow, if we can get behind these and push hard, that mm -hmm. will weaken the coalition, right? Just just like this morning, right? There was a thing where the Chamber of Commerce uh, was trying to fight one of these new antitrust rules. Uh, it was a rule that the um, the Consumer Finance and Protection Board of the Federal Trade Commission, I can't for, for, I can't remember which, used to cap overdraft fees, which is just this like bullshit thing where they, they there's billions of dollars that flows from the pockets of the poorest people in the country into the yep. pockets of the richest people in the country every year because of this junk fee. And the, the COC, the Chamber of Commerce, which is the most powerful lobbying body in corporate America, tried to do something they've done a million times. They tried to do a, a judge shopping. They wanted to move everything to the Fifth Circuit of Texas, where they had a, a friendly judge. And the Fifth Circuit of Texas, the friendly judge there said, no way. No, this is like not not in today's political mood. Uh, this is a thing you're going to have to fight in front of a judge who actually gives a shit about this stuff. So over and over again, we're seeing these things where where. The actual amount of money in the pockets of poor people is going up as a result of things that we are doing because yeah. we're pissed off about inequality. And I think we get behind that and push. It might not be the thing yeah. that I would have chosen, right? You know, like it might be incremental. It might be the kind of thing I wouldn't choose. But, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take it all day long. 
because uh, this is the this is the 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 string that we can tug on that's going to make the knot start unraveling. And once it starts unraveling, we're going to find other weak parts of the knot that we can tug on as well. There's that's going to give you. That's going to give you. If the orange guy gets in, unfortunately, that's going to give you your dictatorship. Because there, he'll be the one that says, look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. And people are like, yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great. But he's really not doing anything. It's a process that, say, started 15 or 20 years ago, whether it's the Panama Papers, Bernie Madoff, the other guy that got arrested when Bernie Madoff got with an $8 billion Ponzi scheme in the Bahamas, and yeah. I can't remember his name. But yeah. I, it all started, say, 20 years ago. It didn't start today, so to speak. And I think but people you know don't what? read history if people, and they if forget. people... If people don't have to worry at so much about where their next meal is coming from, they have more time right. to fight uh, political causes, right? Like one yeah. of the one of the great impediments to making social progress is that everyone is has got a side hustle for their side hustle, and no one mm -hmm. can even stop treading water long mm -hmm. enough to give a damn about anything. So I'll take yeah. it. Anything that materially improves the circumstances of people mm -hmm. who are getting the shitty end of the stick, I'll take for lots of reasons, right? I'll take it because it's the right thing. Like it makes, it's it's fair, but I'll also take it as good tactics because as mm -hmm. an organizer, I think I'm going to get more people out on the barricades if they're less worried about making rent. Yes. And you talked about saying that this, that this story of, uh, <clears throat> of greed and, and the scam economy started about 40 years ago. Um, can you talk about your thoughts on the origin of it? Because we've had Michael Collins, uh, the author of uh, uh, talking about multinational corporations gutting American manufacturing. And he also places the beginning of all this kind of scam economy about 40 years ago with, uh, uh, with, with Reagan and, um, and the, and the switch yeah. to yeah, uh, it's neoliberalism. To I mean, yeah. you know, that term is like it's thrown around a lot, but you know, in a nutshell, it's the it's the deregulation of policies that yes. used to limit um, that used to limit the the uh, the the extent to which rich people got richer and poor people got poorer, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of those things where where I find it. I think that it takes a like an act of will to not understand it, because it's like, look, <laughs> we used to put down rat poison, and we didn't have rats. And then we stop putting down the rat poison and now rats are eating our face. And we're like, maybe we should put down rat poison again, right? Maybe we should bring back those, you know, pre-Carter administration policies that that uh, uh, limited certain elements of, of uh, you know, commercial conduct. Uh, and people are like, are you kidding? Rat poison doesn't work. That's so old fashioned, <laughs> right? right? You know, like the rats are here because of the great forces of history, right? The rats aren't here because we stopped putting down rat poison. Like, like people are like, oh, antitrust. How could antitrust possibly work, right? Mm -hmm. Tech has got natural monopolies, mm -hmm. right? And so we get natural monopolies and then we're just going to get monopolies. And that's why. And it's not because, you know, Apple buys 90 companies a year. A year it's not yeah. because Google has, has only ever made one successful product, which was a search engine 25 years ago. And everything else they've tried to make in-house failed. And if they had been prohibited from buying a mobile stack, an ad tech stack, a video stack, mm -hmm. server management, customer management, docs, maps, uh, satellite photos, every other successful thing they had, they would have failed. They're like, right. we would, they would, they would be just another one of those companies that did something amazing, failed to continue to innovate. Oh, you mean Yahoo? Got replaced by someone else. <laughs> you mean Yahoo? Again? Got it. Yeah. Like Yahoo. You think Yahoo. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Yahoo. like, 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 right. like, like Silicon Graphics, right? right. <laughs> like Atari like yep. Commodore, like the digital equipment company, like like the normal life cycle of businesses, right? You, right. You, you, Clay Christensen has written about this. Many people have written about this. Businesses have a couple of good ideas and they ossify. And, you know, we look at Google today. If if we were, if if uh, the, the thing that we were using to estimate whether a company would still be in business tomorrow is, is whether its products were getting better, then we should assume that Google is going to crater. Right, because every one of its products has gotten monotonically worse. Right, they mm -hmm. just just suck. Right, and yet they still have ninety percent of the search market. Now, how do they get ninety percent of the search market? Well, the capital markets is happy to fund them to spend a whole ass Twitter every single year buying default position mm -hmm. on every single place where you might ever encounter a search engine. Right, the largest deal that Apple and Google do every year is a twenty-six billion dollar deal 
to make Google the default search for Apple, which means that every Apple user gets spied on by Google, the company, and, and Apple is the company that says, oh, we won't let anyone spy on you. Right, right, um, right, right. And, and, you know, if you remember the first time you tried Google, it was like, oh, I'm never using, you know, Lycos again. I'm done, right? right? Like I've, I've now found the better search engine. So Google has just sat there and they've done the math, right? Either we can make sure that if someone ever tries another search engine, the reason they stick with Google is because we're better, or we can spend less money and make sure nobody ever tries another search engine. And they're like, well, best thing for our shareholders <laughs> is to right. light $40 billion a year on fire, making sure no one tries another search engine rather than spending $60 billion a year making a better search. To actually engine. innovate, right. Yeah. yeah. And that might it's... be the bigger, you know, that might be the bigger, uh, the challenge here. So as things are actually evolving and changing to where hopefully, I mean, I agree with you, Corey, with th this idea of hope giving you the ability to take a step forward and then hoping that you can keep taking steps forward in these directions. Um, do we see, do, is there is there a light at the end of the tunnel where the, the tech empires do start uh, allowing innovation or innovating themselves or falling away to give space for, for actual innovation? So I think there are four forces that made tech good. And, and I think the absence of those four forces has made tech bad. Uh, so the first one was competition, right? We all remember Lily mm -hmm. Tomlin doing those SNL beats where she played the telephone operator and she would end each yeah. ad with, by saying, uh, we don't care, we don't have to, we're the phone company. Right. So, you know, you let these companies buy all their competitors and do predatory pricing and, you know, cook up these sweetheart deals where they just make sure that like no one ever gets to try anything else. And, and yeah, they don't care. They don't have to, they're Amazon, they're Google, they're Apple. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and that's where the rise and rise of antitrust energy all around the world is so exciting. Uh, it's why, you know, blocking and unwinding mergers, banning uh, predatory pricing, doing all this stuff that's like um, stuff that we've had on the law books, like it's been in the toolkit, but we just like let the tools get rusty at the bottom of the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And now you have these enforcers in Europe, in the UK, in the US, in Australia, in China, there's like a huge tech antitrust movement in China being hmm. led by Xi Jinping, like it's coming from the top down. You know, you have these uh, ghouls like um, Nick Clegg, who's like the government relations guy for Facebook, he used to be the deputy prime minister of, of the UK and had such a terrible term in office that he's now so hated he had to quit politics. And so now he, he gets four million a year from Facebook to go around and say bullshit like, if you make Facebook weaker, China will take over cyberspace because Good they have China. all these yeah they have all these companies that are they you know according to him all these companies are just stalking horses for the ccp for the chinese communist party yep. and then you have like xi jinping like rounding up the leadership of chinese tech companies and putting them in gulags it's like all right tell me again Literally how these guys that. are all yeah. on the same side like yeah. bullshit right not that i want anyone in gulags not even nick clegg but but like it's just it, like it just doesn't hold together as an explanation mm -hmm. so we got this antitrust stuff happening everywhere even canada where i'm from which is like the the home of the, you know, evil billionaire. Canada has had some of the worst antitrust law in the world. We don't have the, the, the base bedrock of a good antitrust law, which is something called the abuse of dominance standard, which is like mm -hmm. literally what it sounds like, right? A law that says, if you abuse your dominance, you're a violating antitrust, right? And they right. finally promised to they introduce finally... it this legislative session. Right, right. That just happened. Yeah. 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 So there's, so there's that. There's also um, uh, regulation has historically constrained companies, right? Uh, and the problem is that if you don't enforce antitrust, you can't enforce any other regulation. Because once mm. a sector has got like five companies in it, they capture their regulators, right? right. Because they, they're just like, you know, they can all agree on what their message is. And then they've got tons of money left over because they're not competing with each other. And so they can spend it to make sure that whatever that common policy is turns into the policy the rest of us have to live under. Like if you remember... Back when, you know, tech was fighting the entertainment industry back in the Napster Wars, you had like yeah. seven entertainment companies, which is now like four. And you had uh, you had like 200 tech companies and they were all at each other's throats. And the seven entertainment companies had total message discipline. And even though they were like 1% of the size of the tech industry, even then, they just kicked their asses in Europe and Canada and the US and the UK everywhere. They just kicked tech's asses. And so... Uh, that is why today tech is able to violate our labor laws, our consumer laws, our privacy laws, and just like nobody ever enforces it against them. They have cooked up this thing where they've convinced regulators that if you violate the law, but do an app 
uh, in the middle of the violation, then it's not a violation, right? Yeah, but you that's know? changed now in the EU because the EU right. now is fining all of them. Like, I think Facebook just got hit with another fine. Google got hit. They're yeah, all getting they're, hit because the EU's uh, like enough. It's, 10% of their annual turnover if for yeah. first offense and 20% of their annual turnover if they fail and it rises from there. So so it's 10% yeah. of their annual turnover. So not profit, but turnover. It's a it's right. these are gigantic funds. So mm -hmm. we're starting to see a resurgence of regulation as well. The third constraint that was on tech was actually another kind of it was like a reverse regulatory constraint, which was that other tech companies that wanted your business would give you tech that let you take back the thing the tech company took away from you, right? So like they raise the price of ink, someone makes a third party ink cartridge. And right. what happened was that as tech uh, giants were able to capture their regulators, they were able to also selectively enforce IP law against their critics or against their, their mm -hmm. competitors. So, you know, the, the, there's a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Bill Clinton signed it into law in 1998. It's a big gnarly law, section 1201 makes it a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense to provide someone with an unlocking tool. And so you have companies that just add a lock to their thing and right. then and then doing anything to make that product better becomes a felony. So like if you're if you're you know running a website and you're like hanging around the boardroom table and and trying to figure out how you're going to meet your KPIs and get a big bonus and go to France and ski this Christmas with your family. You know, someone says, "Hey guys, I've got this great idea. We're going to make the ads 20% more obnoxious. That's going to get us 2% more revenue. Uh and we're all going to get a giant bonus." At that meeting because the web is an open platform, where anyone can add plugins to a web browser. You have to worry that someone's gonna stick their hand up and say like, I like how you're thinking, Bob, but what happens if 40% of our users go to a search engine and type, how do I block ads? Because at that point, our revenue from that user, it doesn't stay at 100%, doesn't go up to the 102% you're hoping for. It falls to zero, it stays there forever. No one ever went back to the search engine and typed, how do I start seeing ads again? Now. 50% of web users have installed an ad blocker. It's the largest consumer mm -hmm. boycott in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. No one has ever installed an ad blocker for their apps because to reverse engineer the app is a felony. And right. so at that same board meeting where someone says, all right, moving on to the app, why don't we make those ads 20% more obnoxious? Same guy puts his hand up and says, Bob, I love how you think, but you're thinking too small. Why don't we make them 100% more obnoxious? Because we don't care if the user types, how do I block ads in an app into a search engine? Because the answer they're going to get is, can't. you can't, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which is why every platform wants you to use their app and not their website, because right. you can't adapt an app. An app is just a web page skinned in enough IP law to make it a felony to modify it so it doesn't spy on you, right? And so, uh, you know, that was the third constraint, the mobilization of, of IP law to, to prevent that made that constraint go away. Now that's also weakening that 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 um, IP law stuff. So the Oregon right to repair bill that just passed mm -hmm. is groundbreaking yes. mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. But the biggest one is something that I think you have to have a little bit of kind of, you have to be in the weeds to get, but it's right. it, it bans something called parts pairing. And parts pairing is when you put a digital lock on a subcomponent of a gadget. So like you take a, the screen assembly for an, for an iPhone and you add a little security chip to it. And then if, if I, as the technician, install that screen in a phone, unless I have Apple's unlock code, even though it's an Apple part in an Apple phone, the Apple phone won't use it, right? Hmm. And so this is why you keep, you, like if you've paid any attention to this, you, you keep hearing Apple saying, oh, we like right to repair now. And every time it's because they've got something like this, where it's like, oh yeah, anyone can fix an Apple device. We, we're going to like provide manuals, but we're not going to provide those unlock codes. So unless you're an authorized Apple uh, tech, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you're allowed to perform the thing doesn't mean that you can perform the thing. So Oregon just banned it. They just said there's a certain kind of IP law you can no longer avail yourself of if you make a device for the purposes of repair. So we're starting to see more of this idea where you, where adversarial interoperability, like adding something or doing something to a product the manufacturer doesn't like is something you're still allowed to do. That you know, we don't have felony contempt of business model in this country. And Which then is amazing. The, you have to be explicit to yeah, uh, to allow sure. It Sure, right. And then the last piece of constraint that we had and that's going away were the tech workers themselves. And tech workers are a really strange bunch. 
because they've had a lot of labor power through history, mm. but not the usual way people get labor power, which is in a trade union. Um, they had labor power because of scarcity, right? They were just like more tech jobs than there were tech workers. And for their bosses, that meant they had to find a way to, to motivate them to work the way tech workers do, right? To, to like put in 100 hour weeks and miss their kids' little league games and miss their mom's funerals and stuff. And the way they did it was they said, all right, the reason we've outfitted your office as a kind of whimsical campus with like free laundry and gourmet cafeterias and like um mm -hmm. unlimited uh unlimited kombucha massages <laughs> on wednesdays you know like we'll freeze your eggs for you if you want to work through your fertile years the reason for that is because you're on a mission with us to do something socially important to bring in a new digital era Right. And that actually worked. These workers who could otherwise name their price, walk across the street and get a better job, hung in there and 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 worked like government mules in order to meet stupid arbitrary deadlines. Now, the problem from the boss's perspective is that if you motivate workers by appealing to their sense of mission, they will, in fact, experience a sense of mission. And then you say they'll to them, to hmm? they'll hold you to it. Yeah, they'll say like you say I want to shitify this 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 thing you know you built and they'll say not no, I won't do it. I'll quit. Right? That's not what I missed my mom's funeral for and they can make it stick cuz the guy across the street will give them a job. So right. now 260,000 tech layoffs, right? Mm -hmm. Google fires 12,000 technical workers after an 80 billion dollar stock buyback that would have paid their wages for 27 years. Those <laughs> workers, they're not lining up to say I won't do it and you can't make me because they, they know what the alternative is. But mm -hmm. those at the same time, those workers are starting to think about unions instead. And what's yep. really interesting about that unionization is the solidarity between technical workers and other workers at tech companies like Amazon coders who walk out in sympathy with Amazon warehouse workers. Because mm -hmm. they understand, right? Like the reason they get to wear a black t-shirt that says something their boss doesn't understand and they've got like a nose piercing and, you know, they 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 get all these perks and like they're not peeing in a bottle next to their desk the way that, that you know, those warehouse workers are at their warehouse station. You know, it's very weird that like for a guy who builds penis rockets, Jeff Bezos hates our kidneys so much. Um, right. the, 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 the reason that that is the case is that they have bargaining power. And if that bargaining power is going away, they're going to be pissing in bottles too. Right? right. They're going to be wearing the same humiliating uniforms that the people who clean the toilets wear. Right. And and so that is also a very exciting force. And all of it's very exciting because although tech is not the most important thing in our world, right, we, we have much more important struggles about, you know, whether we're going to have a habitable planet, whether we're going to fall into fascism, whether genocides will occur, whether we'll get justice for uh, historically discriminated against racial and gender minorities, right? All of those things are like way more important than like how the internet works. But the internet's where we're going to fight those fights. Yeah. Uh, and so if we don't have the free, fair and open internet, we lose the fights before they even start. So you're asking like, how do we build mass movements? Where, where the mass movement is going to come from? They're going to be built on the internet. Like as a guy who spent his teen years riding a bicycle around Toronto with a bucket of wheat paste on my handlebars so that I could put up mm -hmm. flyers to get people to a protest march. I'm here to tell you, like, right. we're not going to organize mass mar movements without the internet. So right. we, I think, are closer to recovering the internet, to building a new good internet that is the worthy successor of that old good internet whose defect wasn't that it was too free, but that not enough people knew how to use it. And we're going to make the internet that happened in between into like an unfortunate transitional stage between that old good internet and this new good internet. I, I love, I, I, I love. You're very you optimistic. You're uh, hopeful, hopeful, I should say. Yeah, hopeful. you're very hopeful. hopeful. I unfortunately disagree because I don't think the billionaires and trillionaires and all the governments that can actually control everything are going to give a rat's ass. John D. Yeah. Rockefeller didn't give a rat's ass. And, and he Rockefeller, still died I mean, a multi-billionaire. And so, and, you know. And, but he didn't die running the American economy, right? And that's and, okay because once you get to a certain level of wealth, you don't really care because there's enough behind the scenes stuff you can do to give the little guy what he thinks has power and go, look, I gave, I give them this. But that's not what happened happy. with the New Deal. What happened with right. the New Deal is they- Oh, no, no, them. I understand that. I'm just saying right. that. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a, a, a one molecule thick layer of, of right. uh, you know, a better life. It was, you know, huge sweeping material changes in the living conditions yeah. of the majority of Americans. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And right. again, like but there were problems time with them. Get... Yeah. I don't well, think but time those guys, get they weren't it. wizards. They weren't wizards. No, they weren't right. doing, they weren't doing tricks. We've forgotten how to do and their, and right. their enemies weren't less vicious or powerful than our enemies. John D. Rockefeller. Yeah, right. No. So John so, Rockefeller, Ford, all of those guys. Yes. All I'm, Carnegie, I'm aware. Mellon, yeah. you know, <laughs> Andrew Carnegie, when he was treasury, the secretary also owned all the aluminum in the world. They call him the man who right. owned an element. And uh, while he was treasury, the secretary of the United States government, while it was at war, he stopped selling aluminum to the U.S. government and shut down the American warplane construction industry so that he could raise the price of aluminum. Oh, right. See, that's how powerful. Yeah, that's yeah. how powerful these guys were. Right. Right. They yeah. were not that we are not fighting giants of unprecedented scale. Yeah. We are not stupider than the people who fought the last set of giants. Uh, if they did it before. I don't know about do that. I, I don't know about that because I don't well, think people understand history. I think they're more clueless, maybe not as stupid, but I think they're clueless to what uh, they can and can't do. I think it's a small percentage of the population that thinks like you do because they uh, don't want to play off. Keep writing. Well, the, the keep keep writing what you're writing, Corey, because you yeah. are, I, I believe it. you are yeah. spreading and tapping <laughs> into uh, a very important uh note of of feeling that uh, that people are aligned with and i see that even when I, even on youtube there are there are people in their 40s and 30s who are reminiscing about the the pre the 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 early internet days yeah even right. the customization they're they're reminiscing doing videos about reminiscing about how you could customize your myspace page versus a facebook yep. page and what that actually meant for what the rep, the internet represented at that time Yep. So I do believe that it's happening. People miss uh, it. They know something got taken away from them. They know something got taken away. That's right. You That's know, true. and and like I do think that people have some wrong ideas about it. I think some people actually do think that tech is made up of like dopamine hacking wizards who put us all in under a spell and made your grandpa into a QAnon. Uh, right. I th- I and I think that like one of the jobs of smart tech critics is to move us out of that realm of the mystical and into the realm of the material. Yeah. Right. Like, right. like what, what actual, like what happened? Like actually, what does Facebook do when someone is radicalized? What is that? What is that actually, what is actually happening there? Why, why do people yeah. believe these things? What is like the underlying technical stuff happening? Which is why yeah. it's important that tech critics be smart about technology as well as about policy. And you are my friend. And that's why we love right. having you here. So <laughs> and as we told you the last time, you are more than welcome to come back whenever you would like. Well, this is the next time we see you in the Financial Times, of course, we'll tell everybody it's because of us. Um, okay. So, but no, we we love your books. We enjoy your when you're here with us. You you open up our minds, and our fans love you, um, and your fans love you. So please come back. Well, the pleasure is mutual. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. So, right. And we know you have to go. So yes. we're going to let you go. And it was a pleasure seeing you, and we'll see nice you again to see soon. You too. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. All uh, right. Very nice. Another now rousing. It's just us girl. Now it's just us girls. Just so, us girls. Another rousing, say, another rousing conversation with Corey. I love when he's on. I agree with like I would say 80%, but because people are still ostriches, and I'm, I I like him because he, he knows the history, yeah. but I don't think the people today are going to um, rise up like they did against the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Mellons and J.P. Morgan and all these other. I think – it's it's nice, but because and I, I think it's also going to depend who wins the November election, what happens as well. That would be my there's, that's my take on it. Well, there's and there's uh, and my thinking is uh, maybe you don't need as many people to wake up as you needed back then because there's a True. there's a leverage effect in terms of the influence that you can have using the very technologies that we're talking about right. um, to wake people up in a different way in a different scale. Um, but I do like that he he makes the differentiation between hope and optimism, and yes. uh, I am very hopeful about where things. He's could very go. he's very hopeful as he's well. Very hopeful I I speak when I speak I speak for the Illuminati and the lizard That's people. Right. No, we know that we're all basically you're all screwed. So it's That's nice that he's optimistic and hopeful. It's not happening. So I didn't want to tell him that. I didn't want to crush him for the next book. I want to read. No, no, no. Um, and we need those books. Let us do. We have to. We have it's to let. Perfect. Listen. We got to let the guys have some. Have a little bit of faith that the world's going to be better. And it's that's not. right. That's there right. you go. Let's do some lost and found. Hold on. Here Let's we go. Welcome to this week's lost and found. Uncovering dollar winners and losers. 
where we discuss dollars lost and dollars gained by various companies and projects. All right. Thing, let me just say really quick about Corey is we don't have to speak. It's like having Michael Collins on. <laughs> All we have to do is say hello. And it's an hour of like, I get paid to do nothing. I like it. <laughs> so it and that's a compliment. Yes. That's, that find, is a compliment. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, look, I'll, give, well, you, I'll friend, give you the lost and found that I found. Uh, and this sure. is definitely lost. Uh, this is a lost one. It okay. turns yeah. out that, and the New York Times is reporting on something that has been pretty well known for the past year or so. Uh, right. But it, it it got the front front page of the New York Times is that uh, one out of four public school students right. were considered chronically absent last school year, which before the pandemic, it was 15 percent. And now you're talking right. about 26 percent or more wow. uh, across 40 different states. And this is a serious, uh, a serious uh, concern. Uh, and this is maybe a vote with maybe this is a, a, a vote from students who are just saying they don't want to participate in this kind of school system. That's what maybe the conservative leaning American Enterprise Institute is implying. But the reality is they're just not going. Uh, they're just not going. And that's cool. that's a real, Which, where's the parent? Where's the parents? Where are the parents? <laughs> yeah. it's like, take your kid to well, school. Oh, that's bullshit. I, I have a problem with this. If my kid said to me, I don't have one, but if my kid said to me, I'm not going to school today, I'd be like, how many oh, teeth yeah. do you want to lose? I mean, like, <laughs> not, sure, I'm old school. How many teeth do you need to lose before you're going to go? That's ridiculous. Right, right. Dumbest thing I've heard. You go to school, you learn. Now, we discussed this off air. We'll discuss it a little bit on air. My stepson goes to a private school, yeah. and I know what they pay for it. Um, I don't think he learns jack shit. So if he said he didn't want to go, I would delicious. totally understand. And, yeah. and I would and I would understand that, um, but you still have to go. They still, still have, have to, to try to mold you into something. And I'm just like, the education between here and China. China actually teaches their students something. There was an article in the FT the other day that said in China there's a law that if you're 18 years uh, older, 18 years or younger, you're only allowed to be on your phone two hours a day. The rest of the time you need to learn or do whatever. In America, I think it's the other way around. You must be on your phone 22 hours a day, um, and they're in it. Well, that's what, the app, that's what the app makers want. So, right, but see, but that's where we have a problem is we're not doing it. So when kids don't go to school, I don't know if it's because what the American Institute said. I disagree. I don't think it's because they don't want to learn. I think they, they think they can do more with their app and have more fun doing things. Well, that than might they can be right. actually do. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, and I, that the, in the way, and we we might actually do an episode in the future yeah. on American oh. education. We might be I doing that uh, Let me see because it's an interesting right. conversation about yeah. uh, the quality yeah. of education in America, what it's really focusing on, what it should be or should not focus on. And, yeah. uh, and yeah. the quality is what's important because we are influencing the future generations. And if they're just not even participating, that, that could not. be indicative of a bigger, that could be indicative of a bigger problem, not look, just, look at, not just look their at this way. If this, I don't know what age groups aren't going to school, but if they're not going to school in 20 years, what's going to happen? There's only going to be, just say, a handful of kids that actually went to school, learned something. They're running the planet or they're running this country, depending on what happens in November with the orange guy. So this is, you know, this is not a good thing for the people. And the fact that the parents are complacent. That's is not a big good. problem. Too. It's That's the parents, more of the problem. It's the parents who are giving them the iPads. I mean, we, we, we talk... Yeah. To, we talk yep. to that audience or talk with that audience yep. uh, quite a bit. All the time. All right. the time. Here's my. Here's mine. I'm sorry we have no video. David's not here today. So if you're waiting for David to show you it's the, the cow on the moon video, that'll be in uh, Fortnite because he won't be here next week either. That'll be in a um, Fortnite. So ESG, China's Jingzhao Zhuzhu, better known as Big Panda because I love the guy, says ESG is nothing more than woke Western crap. Full stop. In those in words. Article, <laughs> in those words, in an article, in the FT and in the Economist. And I was like, wow. Even though yep. we just had all the CEOs over there telling him how wonderful the economy is and whatever, he's like, we BS. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the US trying to kick them out of everything. So I think they're just like, you know what? Screw you. There's, we're not doing ESG. We don't care. It's a bunch yep. of Western woke crap. And I was like, wow, that is literally 
the tiger slash dragon throwing down the gauntlet. Yes. Yes, that's that what is, it sounds like. That's what it sounds that like. Is, they're, that they're, is, not, they're not going to screw around. Lost or found? <laughs> um, I think yours is definitely a loss. Yeah, right? that's a loss. I, I'm assuming it depends. I'm not a fan of ESG either. I think it's a bunch of crap. So for me, I think it's a found dollar. I yeah, don't see yeah. where it's helping anything. I think it's just a bunch of BS that somebody came up with some accounting firm to make some more money. But I think it's useless. Yeah. Well, I think that so, we, we did a show, we did an episode on that and it, it, the, the data shows, proves that out, it seems. Yeah. Uh, so I think, not, yeah. But kudos to China. So, and now if John was here, he could go off for an hour, but he's not. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Well, there we go. I'm sure he will be. So, well, every, that was our show. It was very quick because Corey it. was here and we want to thank, once again, Corey Doctorow and his new book, The Bezel, B-E-Z-Z-L-E. That's right. Is that, is that, and we'll put the links and everything below. We want to thank Corey. Don't forget, you can listen to us every Saturday morning on our podcast, which are on Google and Apple. We apparently don't like them anymore, um, <laughs> or Spotify or Amazon or wherever you get your podcast. Or if you want to see what uh, pretty we look in the mornings, um, you can see us here on YouTube, six o'clock in the morning, EST time. So for anybody who doesn't know what that means, just six o'clock in the morning in New York. That's when the show comes out That's on it. podcasting and YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe and like, tell your friends, and we will see everybody here um, next Saturday morning. Well done, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Good to Always see you. Always a pleasure. Cheers, everybody.